Hello, Esther Gidu Yort. It's Tuesday, November 2nd. This is Africa 54. Several people are trapped following a high-rise collapse in Lagos. In an Africa 54 exclusive, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation co-founder Bill Gates sounds the alarm on climate change. And in a first for Zimbabwe, a visually impaired judge is appointed to the high court bench. We begin our broadcast in Nigeria, where at least six people have died in the collapse of a luxury tower which was under construction in Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. Witnesses say up to 100 people are missing. Angela Okumadu has the story. At least six people have died after the collapse of a high-rise building under construction in Nigeria's megacity, Lagos. Lagos State Emergency Services Chief Olufemi Oke Osaitolu said a search and rescue effort is ongoing after Monday's incident. Four people were rescued alive and three more treated for injuries at the scene, he said. Witnesses say up to 100 people are missing after the luxury residential structure being built in the affluent Ikoi district crumbled to the ground. We are working on Speaking on Monday, construction worker Israel said he has just gone on a break when the building came down. The collapsed structure was part of three towers being built by private developer Fourscore Homes. Building collapses are not uncommon in Nigeria where rules are poorly enforced and construction material often substandard. But the cause of Monday's collapse is not yet known. Telephone calls for numbers listed for four score homes and the main building contractor did not ring through. That was Angela Okumadu of Reuters reporting. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he is alarmed over reports that rebellious Tigran forces have captured two towns in the neighboring Amhara region. David Doyle reports. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he is alarmed by reports that forces from Ethiopia's Tigray have taken over two key towns. The Tigray People's Liberation Front said on Sunday its fighters were in control of Kumbulchar and its airport, having claimed the capture of Desi the day before, which the government denied. Both are located in Amhara, which neighbours the northern Tigray region. On Monday, Ethiopia's government communication service said Tigrayan forces had summarily executed 100 youths in Kumbulchar. TPLF spokesperson Geitachi Reda denied the allegation, saying there was no resistance in Kumbulchar. An Ethiopian government spokesman did not immediately reply to a request for comment on Geitachi's response, but had earlier referred Reuters back to the government statement. Verifying such accounts is difficult, as communications to the area are down and journalists barred. Kompolchar would be a strategic gain for the Tigrayan forces in the nearly year-long conflict with the federal military and its allies. It's located on a major highway around 235 miles from Addis Ababa. If confirmed, the seizure would be the closest to the capital, and the furthest south into Amhara that Tigrayan forces have reached since pushing into the region in July. Speaking on Monday, Blinken said continued fighting was prolonging a dire humanitarian crisis in northern Ethiopia. He urged all parties to cease military operations and begin a ceasefire without preconditions. Thousands have died since the conflict broke out and more than two million have been forced to flee their homes. That was David Doyle of Reuters with that report. 
the United States is planning to remove Ethiopia, Mali and Guinea from the agreement that gives them duty-free access to the United States. President Joe Biden revealed in a letter to Congress Tuesday citing human rights violations. The move comes amid an ongoing conflict and famine in Ethiopia's northern region of Tigray and after coups in Guinea in September and in Mali last year. President Biden says Ethiopia is not in compliance with the African Growth and Opportunity Act eligibility requirements for gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Guinea and Mali have not made progress toward establishing the rule of law and political inclusion, and Mali has failed to establish workers' rights and human rights, according to Biden's letter. Despite intensive engagement between the United States and the governments of Ethiopia, Guinea and Mali, these governments have failed to address U.S. concerns about their non-compliance with their Goa eligibility criteria, according to Biden's letter to Congress. Early results from South Africa's local elections on Tuesday give the ruling African National Congress 46% of the vote, with results in from just over 25% of the polling stations nationwide. The Electoral Commission says it expected 90% of the results to be finalized by Tuesday evening in a vote widely seen as a referendum on the ANC's 27-year stint in charge of Africa's most industrialized nation. At the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, U.S. President Joe Biden apologized for the U.S. withdrawal from the 2015 Paris Climate Accord under his predecessor, Donald Trump. Biden says the U.S. is now back at the table to lead on climate. But as White House Bureau Chief Patsy Widakuswara reports, it's unclear just how much he can deliver. Climate activists pose as world leaders playing in a traditional Scottish pipe band near the COP26 UN Climate Summit in Glasgow. They say wealthy polluting nations are not slashing greenhouse gases quickly enough. There they are in a hot air band uh, in Glasgow. What we need is action. US President Joe Biden is promising exactly that. We'll demonstrate to the world the United States is not only back at the table, but hopefully leading by the power of our example. Biden expressed regret that under the Trump administration, the U.S. has been largely absent in global climate talks. We should apologize for the fact the United States, uh, the last administration, pulled out of the Paris Accords and put us sort of behind people. Developing nations that suffer the worst impacts of climate change want wealthy nations to fulfill their climate financing commitment to help them with $100 billion a year. Biden announced an initiative to provide $3 billion per year by 2024 as part of his broader climate financing package, but it's not certain he can deliver. I'm unclear whether he, he has this. Um, is the backing of Congress to provide assistance to developing countries in meeting climate goals. On the sidelines, Biden met with President Joko Widodo of Indonesia, a key country in a region where Chinese influence is rising. The Indonesian leader will take over the G20 presidency from Italy in December. From Edinburgh, Scotland, Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. As world leaders gather in Glasgow this week for a pivotal climate summit, COP26, experts warn that climate change and global warming may reach catastrophic levels if more is not done to address issues such as cutting greenhouse gas emissions. According to the United Nations, about 4 billion people have been affected by events related to the changing climate over the last decade, including deadly floods, wildfires, drought and malnutrition. Africa 54 correspondent Lino Mudu spoke in an exclusive interview with Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who joined her from the climate summit and asked him how concerned we should be about climate change. Climate change is one of the biggest challenges mankind has ever faced because year by year, because of these carbon emissions, the climate will be getting hotter. And that means particularly anywhere near the equator, the ability to do outdoor farming or outdoor construction work uh, will become impossible. And so that'll really destabilize people who live in these tropical zones. We have to do two things. We have to stop those emissions 
And then in the meantime, we need to help countries adapt to these changing weather conditions. For example, you know, giving them better seeds that can deal with the increased temperature. You know, this meeting, I was at the Paris meeting six years ago. This one's, you know, bigger and broader. Um, so there is some attention, but, you know, we still have to do a lot more. The Paris meeting, which happened in 2015, how much progress have been made since then? And how are we going to know that uh, COP26 is a success? We've deeply engaged the private sector. We've identified the need for innovation and how we get every sector working together to drive that innovation. And we're now paying a significant effort to adaptation. Those three things were not there in Paris. I'm not saying that the commitments here are good enough. We need to say over the next five years, the same type of increased engagement on uh, the different issues, including the innovation that's focused on the adaptation. Innovation is something that you discuss in your book you released this year, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Uh, what sorts of innovation you, you just mentioned? See, what, what else are, are, you, are you referring to? The, big announcement from us is that, that we're part of the, the aim for c adaptation, innovation for climate change. A big part of that is this helping the smallholder farmers. A number of countries are announcing increased resources, including President Biden, will make uh, significant announcements. We're announcing $315 million over the next three years for the, uh, the seed consortium, which is called the CG system that makes the seeds for all the different countries. The big priority for that money will be seeds that can be even more productive despite the challenge of climate change. We expect that an additional a billion dollars, including our money, will be committed to that effort. That has the potential to benefit literally hundreds of millions of these smallholder farmers. Some studies show that uh, poor families in developing countries are often the least to blame for man-made climate change. However, they bear the worst of the impact. What are your thoughts on uh, the impact of climate change in uh, underdeveloped countries, especially in a region like Africa? It's a great injustice. My interest in climate change came from seeing that through our agricultural work in Africa, the farmers were often having a more difficult time. And so they're already facing these difficulties, which will get significantly worse between now and the end of the century. I studied the issue of climate change and the Gates Foundation took on this adaptation as a big priority. That wasn't getting much attention, so I joined together with some others to create the uh, Commission on Adaptation. What do you think all of us can do to contribute in this global solution in fighting climate change? There are products that have lower emissions. Uh, it be very different in different countries. In the, the rich countries, you know, we are starting to have food indications of which kinds of food cause what emissions. You know, we have more and more electric cars. For the individual, a political engagement is also important. This is a problem where we have to make near-term investments, you know, even some short-term sacrifice to get the long-term benefit of not having drastic climate change impacts. And so educating people that this is very worth doing, particularly getting young people engaged, you know, we have to start now on this work. It's a tougher problem to solve than even say the pandemic was. The pandemic, we invented one tool, you know, we still don't have that out to everyone, but the vaccine gave us a chance to finish over time the pandemic. With climate change, we need lots and lots of tools. There are those who still don't believe in climate change, whether it's by uh, willful ignorance or factual ignorance. What do you say to them? The evidence, sadly, is getting much stronger. I believe this is a very solvable problem. You know, my uh, experience in these last six years is that we really are starting the innovations. I've been able to fund through my breakthrough energy efforts a lot of new companies. And now the next five years, we need to take those ideas and deploy them, not just in the rich world, but uh, also in developing countries, including Africa. Bill Gates, thank you so much. We appreciate your time.
Thank you. That was Africa 54 correspondent Lino Mudu speaking with Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There are stark warnings from scientists that a failure to agree to much deeper cuts in greenhouse gas emissions will result in catastrophic and irreversible climate change. But as Henley Ridgewell reports from Glasgow, Scotland, hopes are already fading that the COP26 climate summit will result in any new deal to save the planet. The centre of Glasgow is locked down. These conference halls are officially United Nations territory for the next two weeks as world leaders line up to try to save the planet. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres set the tone. Enough of killing ourselves with carbon. Enough of treating nature like a toilet. Enough of burning and drilling and mining our way deeper. We are digging our own graves. Will that warning be heeded? Over 120 world leaders are attending, some defending their record on climate, others presenting new pledges to curb emissions. India is the world's third biggest polluter. Hopes were high that Prime Minister Narendra Modi would present new plans to cut emissions. Worst. Modi told delegates by 2070, India will achieve the target of net zero emissions. That date is 20 years later than the UN target of 2050, a major disappointment for many climate campaigners. The focus of the summit is not only about pledges made on stage, but about who hasn't shown up at all. President Xi Jinping of China, by far the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, is not attending. He offered only a written statement and made no new significant pledges to cut emissions. It, it, it could be because probably they don't have too much else to, to offer and probably they would prefer to avoid the pressure of, of being in a COP. That could be the reality. President Vladimir Putin of Russia, the world's fourth biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, is also absent. Among climate campaigners, the disappointment is already palpable. This COP26 is so far just like the previous COPs, and that has led us nowhere. They have led us nowhere. But others say COP26 shouldn't be written off. To have finally a collective vision for the world that nobody's doubting or questioning, I think it is a good thing. But now we do need to have more clear actions, not only targets, but more clear action. In summit after summit, world leaders have pledged ambitious targets to cut emissions. The message here is that it's time to turn those promises into concrete policies. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News at the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow. Still to come, Zimbabwe has appointed its first visually impaired judge to the country's high court. We'll have the details, but first, Heidi Adams tells us what's coming up on Wednesday's Straight Talk Africa. On the next edition of Straight Talk Africa, we'll explore the multiple waves of the global African diaspora. Diasporan communities are found in nearly every part of the world, but how has their connection to the continent changed over generations? We'll also profile young diasporans making their mark in American politics. Be sure to join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back to Africa 54. The different diaspora groups that make up the United States inevitably have fought for representation through the voting process. VOA is profiling a group of emerging politicians with direct ties to Africa who are changing the face of American politics. One is Nakwita Ricks, who hails from Liberia. Hi, my name is Nakwita Ricks. I am a Colorado State Representative for House District 40. I have learned so many things in my freshman session as a state legislator. I have learned how to pass bills. I have learned, you know, how to conduct myself in the Committee of the Whole. It's been a very fascinating place to learn about, you know, the politics, how laws are passed, 
serving on the different committees, the business and labor committee, also the public health and behavior committee that I served on. We responded yeah. to so many earlier this year when yeah. the unemployment issue was going on, but now yeah. we're getting the results. So that's a yeah. good thing. Mm -hmm. Hearing about Colorado's problems and coming up with solutions to fix it through these bills has been just so rewarding for us. One out of every 10 persons here in Colorado is an immigrant. Six out of every small businesses here are started by immigrant entrepreneurs like myself. The state of Colorado, the House of Representatives convened in the 73rd General Assembly, hereby extends sincere tribute to the immigrants and immigrants descended families of Colorado in honor of National Immigrant Heritage Month. I offer this tribute as a refugee and the first African immigrant to serve in the Colorado State House. My own family came to Colorado um, in 1980 after a bloody military coup in Liberia, West Africa, where I'm from. My mother was held at gunpoint for over two hours while my sister and I watched. We didn't know if she was going to live or die in that encounter. And the reason why they were interrogating her was because she was engaged to a government official. When they found him, they dragged him to our driveway um, along with my mother. And just by the grace of God, she was not taken. After a few days, they had rounded up all 13 ministers of the government and they tied him and shot them by firing squad. Within a couple months of that occurrence, we were able to come to the United States, eventually got here to Aurora, where I live today. Thank you, Representative Briggs. And so to stand there in the State House and be representing my district, um, that moment was just really striking for me. And I, you know, it was just a lot to process. But I think that's what we talk about when we say that we talk about American dream. Um, I think people come from all over the world, escaping famine, war, political unrest like we did and they come to seek a better life and I've been so fortunate to be blessed here in Colorado not only representing my district but to start my own business to raise my daughter and to be able to contribute to others within my community is is a true joy so this is Aurora Central High School this is where I spent four years and coming to America, leaving all my friends in Liberia and now having to make new friends. This school is predominantly um, immigrant because there's so, so many people here um, that, that are from many different countries. I mean, it's a very, very diverse school. It's one of the most diverse ones within the rural public schools. I remember walking in snow my first time. <laughs> oh God. We were walking to school and I kept slipping and my friends kept laughing at me. It was just silly, but I didn't have, like, I guess, no feet at the time. <laughs> this is my neighborhood that I grew up in. We lived here for about a year before we moved down the street on East Colfax and Joliet. My mom had to work so much harder to do everything and start all over and within 10 years of coming she, she died from cancer so um and my sister and i didn't have a mom and my father died shortly you know so we've gone through a whole lot of stuff and i try not to dwell there but i know that they put enough in us to try to make a difference and to go after your dreams i think we should always dream always reach for something always have something that you're going to I've had lots of traumatic experiences, but there's something on the inside that keeps me going. I'm a person of faith. I keep praying. I fall down. I get up. And I said, never give up. Never give up on your dreams. There's always something. Tomorrow's another day, and the sun will come out. Don't give up on your dreams ever. On Wednesday's episode of the Elected in America series will feature Oye Owolewa, the U.S. Shadow Representative of the District of Columbia. His parents came from Nigeria. 
visually impaired people too often struggle to get ahead, especially in developing countries, including Zimbabwe. But Zimbabwe this month appointed its first visually impaired judge to the country's high court bench. Columbus Mabunga reports from Harare. 46-year-old Samuel de made history when he became the first Zimbabwe's visually impaired person to make it to the country's high court. After he lost his sight at the age of six because of measles, he says he did not want to continue depending on his peasant farmer parents. He worked hard to excel at school until he earned two law degrees at the University of Zimbabwe. His drive, fear of failure and a need to escape poverty. I was also aware that if I miss doing good at school, the next thing would be on the streets begging for assistance. Those, those fears of the unknown were major drivers of, my, of myself to do better in society, to ensure that I run away from, from poverty. Visually impaired 27-year-old Darrington Nkomazana, who works as a researcher at the Judicial Service Commission of Zimbabwe, says the appointment of Deme as a High Court judge demonstrates that there is room for everyone and that Deme's achievement has inspired him and revived his childhood wishes to become a judge. And as a pioneer, he has demonstrated that even those who will come, they will be able to do the same. So I think it's just opened a way for many who are to come, who may have aspirations to be judges. Leonard Marange, director of the Federation of Organizations of Disabled People in Zimbabwe, says the appointment of DMA is a positive example for the community. So for government to have considered him for such an esteemed position, we are quite excited. And uh, of course, we want more to be done, but uh, this is a very gigantic step in the right direction. It's a remarkable development for us in the disability community, in the disability sector. Calling it a milestone meant to give all Zimbabweans equal opportunity to employment regardless of disability. Walter Chikwana, the Secretary of the Judicial Service Commission of Zimbabwe, said the government would ensure access to justice to people with disabilities like Justice Deme and Komazana. Chikwana stressed that merit-based appointments open space for equal opportunities. It's not a favor uh, to these two gentlemen. It's because they have the capacity and they are capable. That's why they are occupying the positions that they are occupying. And us as the employer, what is important is uh, to provide a, a, a good environment for them to be able to do their work. Justice Deme hopes to become a Supreme Court or constitutional judge one day. He hopes his appointment opens the door for people with disabilities and inspires young people. Deme says his appointment shows people aspiring to higher government offices that hard work eventually pays off. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Harare, Zimbabwe.